Alleluia. Alleluia. I want you to realize that something very prophetic is happening in this place. Not just in this place, but over this nation. We are going to be seated shortly, but let me just respond to prophecy. We are going to shout seven hallelujahs. It means halal Yeshua. I sense there is a warring going on in the atmosphere of America right now as I speak. I don't know what it is, but I know that there is something going on politically. Something going on with government, political power. And the instruction I have is to make a prophetic contribution. Listen, listen, please. This is an apostolic and a prophetic ministry where people of discernment, we came by the Spirit to shift something. Hallelujah. The sound of a trumpet always announces a new season. Even the return of Christ will be heralded by the sound of a trumpet. Hallelujah. And so Pastor Nat is going to lead us. He will blast that trumpet prophetically. Not over us. We are prophesying to America now. That whatever is happening in the atmosphere. We are coming as ambassadors. Witnesses. Carriers of fire. Are we together? And so once you hear that blast. We are going to shout hallelujah. It means halal Yeshua. Seven times. And at the seventh time, I'll lead you in that shout. At the seventh time, let there be a shout of victory. The kind of shouts that brought the walls of Jericho down. The kind of shout that destroys everything that is not of God. Who is ready to participate in prophecy? Who is ready to bring down ancient walls? Who is ready to tear down altars that have stood against the progress of the program of God over this nation? Are you ready now? Pastor Nath, please. Hallelujah. Ready for number three. We are shouting hallelujah. Halal Yeshua. Over America. Number four. Halal Yeshua. The God of Joshua, the one who rides upon the wings of the wind. Number five. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Are you ready for the seven shouts now? Listen, we are going to shout this one together with faith in our hearts. This shout is for America, but it's also for your life. Are you ready for this shout now? I want you to see every mountain. Financial mountains. Mountains of demonic oppressions. The Bible says, who are thou mountain before Zerubbabel? That before Zerubbabel thou shalt be made plain. I want you to release your faith. You are not just acting in the flesh. By this shout for some of you, growths and tumors will die from your body. By this shout, you will be rewriting stories. You will overturn court cases. Do you believe that? It's a sound of revival. Revival is not quiet. Revival is noisy because when the king arises, he arises in power. Is someone ready for this shout? At the blast of the trumpet, jump, shout, do whatever you have to do in the spirit and watch those walls crumble. Once we are done shouting, begin to pray in the spirit for the next one minute. Are you ready now? Pastor Nath, please. Every wall, every wall, every gate, every wall, America, we decree and declare, we bring a sound of revival, a sound of revival, a sound of revival, a new season, prophetic season, sons and daughters rising, men of fire rising, into 
I'm hearing in my spirit for you, weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. There may be an area of concern in your life, but hear this prophetic word, weep not. Weep not. Weep not. For the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And there's someone here, you are called into the ministry of prophetic psalmistry. One of the reasons why God brought you here is so that you will connect with deeper fountains. This is what I'm hearing in my spirit. And because you are here tonight by the power that raised Christ from the dead, let that oil like the dew of Hammon, let it rest upon you. Rest upon your ministry. In the name of Jesus Christ. All right, so let's take it a step further now very quickly and examine why revivals fail. I've studied the subject of revival a bit and um, first for myself and then to learn ancient principles for igniting and sustaining a genuine move of God. And in my study, I stumbled across a few factors that have been responsible for the death of many mighty moves. And America, please listen. As much as we have celebrated many moves of God, as much as we have come to ignite another revival, it's important that we know how to sustain the fire, the flames of revival. Hallelujah. Are we learning? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7, Paul makes a very interesting statement. He says there is this treasure in earthen vessels. Someone say earthen vessels. One more time say earthen vessels. So there is this treasure. But there is a problem here that the treasure is locked up within an earthen vessel. Hallelujah. There is this treasure, but that the treasure is locked up within earthen vessels. I wrote something here and then I want you to please listen. Revivals are ignited and sustained across territories to the degree to which God finds yielded, aligned and trained vessels. Revivals are ignited and revivals are sustained within any territory. That includes America, that includes every and any nation connecting. Revivals are only ignited and sustained when God finds available, yielded and trained vessels. Available, yielded and trained vessels vessels one more time available yielded and trained vessels so when you find a territory bankrupt of a move of God a genuine awakening most times it is not because God is hesitant as far as reaching to his people God's vulnerability over man is not left in the dark the Bible is clear as to the fact that he always desires to reach down to man right from the garden of Eden the Bible says, and the Lord came down walking in the cool of the day and he said, Adam, where art thou? And Adam said, I heard your voice, but I hid because I was naked. And he says, who told you you were naked? God's vulnerability over man is clear from scripture. I have loved you with an everlasting love and with my loving kindness, I have drawn you. He always desires to reach down to his people, to reconnect them to grace, to glory, to power, to see that they make progress in their lives. So when it looks like the heavens are closed over people, over families, over territories, over nations. It is not to say God's hands um, are not able to be outstretched towards those people. It is that most times, most times, he's yet to find available, yielded, and trained vessels. Please do not forget these expressions. Available. You can be available and yet not yielded. You can be yielded and yet not trained. You need to be available, you need to be yielded, and you need to be trained. Can we say that together? Say available. Someone say I'm available. 
Number two, you need to be yielded. Say, I am yielded. And now through this conference, you're subjecting yourself to this apostolic training. That tells me, surely, that you will be that vessel that will carry that flame, that revival fire. Do you believe that? Amen. So, the move of God depends on available, yielded, and trained vessels. Now, I helped you understand a spiritual progression yesterday and I want to do a quick recap on that. The average believer must understand the journey, the spiritual progression. How do we evolve in the spirit from being an unbeliever until we become witnesses? The end point, the end product in a believer's journey is that we become manifestations of the glory of God but that we also become witnesses. So Jesus finds ordinary men, some fishers, some, you know, involved in business of all sorts, some confused, and he begins to walk them through this pathway until they finally evolve to be mighty apostles, evangelists, witnesses. So let me walk you through for one minute and please lend me your attention. Number one, the journey that leads to a witness, the kind of vessel that can be used to sponsor a revival. It always starts with the unbeliever. The state of being an unbeliever is a default state. Are we together? The psalmist said, In iniquity did my mother conceive me. Scripture says, All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So from birth, unfortunately, as a product of the original sin, the Bible teaches that all men, all men by default, outside of their encounter with Jesus, the Son of the living God, all men are lost already. No matter how well-intentioned, no matter how sincere you are, once you are yet to encounter Jesus, the Son of the living God, the Bible says you are spiritually dead. You may be sincere, you may be a nice person, loving person, very kind, but spiritually speaking. So Jesus said it this way, I am come that ye may have life. If you had it, you would not come to give you and that you have that life more abundantly. He was speaking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his then only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send his son into the world, are we together, to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Scripture says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, that that person shall be saved. And John taught us in his epistle that this is the record, are we still together? That God had given us eternal life and that that life is in his son so that whoever encounters the son has life. Are we learning now? So everyone you see who has not met Jesus, no matter how sincere, no matter how wonderful, how morally right, the Bible describes such a man to be in a state of death spiritually. Now, when you encounter Jesus through what we call the new birth experience, by confessing his lordship over your life and receiving of his life, a transition happens, Paul taught us. Are we learning now that we... We transit from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And there is a new name and a new status we have immediately. We are called believers. We are called believers. We are called believers. Not yet witnesses, but we are called believers. Are we learning now? So the journey starts from being an unsaved person. Now a saved person. But there is still a problem with this one. Because... It's important for you to know that at the point of initial salvation, only your spirit encounters that life. That salvation experience does not impart upon your mind. And because man is tripartite, it's important that the riches of salvation pours into your entire tripartite being. Are we together? So you would find out that someone who just confessed the Lordship of Christ, the wrong thoughts are still there, the wrong thinking is still there, the stronghold still there, the limitations there, but the person is saved because salvation is a gift. Are we together? Salvation does not require transformation. It is salvation that brings transformation. 
Salvation simply requires that you believe that report and receive by faith. So here is the believer, level one, or the unbeliever. Then by confessing the Lordship of Jesus, you become a believer. But if you leave that believer in that state, he becomes a carnal believer and an inefficient one. Do you know why? Because God cannot do much with such an individual. His mind is still unfruitful to spiritual things. In fact, the only reason why you would know that person were saved was because probably you saw the person making the altar call. Nothing about the life of that person will reflect the glory of God because transformation is yet to happen. Are we together? So once an individual becomes saved, please listen, the next assignment is he is introduced to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in partnership with the Word of God and in partnership with a teaching priest. Did you get that? The Holy Spirit in partnership with the written word and in partnership with a teaching priest. They now begin the journey of transformation. Someone shout it, say transformation. One more time, say transformation. Transformation is defined as the process that makes you become like Christ in experience. It's called transformation. So the Bible says it this way in Romans chapter 12 when you read 1 and 2 it says, I beseech thee brethren by the mercies of God that you offer your bodies unto God a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. He calls it your reasonable act of service. Verse 2 says, do not be conformed to this world. It's the Greek word aeon. The thinking pattern that comes with this system. Then it says, be ye transformed. Are we still here? And that by the renewing of your mind. Be ye transformed. So this is the journey. I submit to you that the most difficult phase in the believer's evolution is the journey of transformation. The reason is because transformation is not a gift. It depends on your partnership with the Holy Spirit. You can decide to resist his transformation. And because he's not a demon spirit, he will respect you. So the face and the level in the spirit you should have attained after a year or two because of your refusal to cooperate with him through that transformative process. After 10 years, you can still be a babe in the spirit. A church goer but a babe even a pastor but a babe and the Bible says a babe a child now is unfruitful in spiritual things someone say transformation one more time shout it say transformation so I agree that you are a believer I do not doubt your salvation experience but are you on that journey to transformation there are evidences evidences to transformation like you will be learning the first evidence that you are transformed is that you begin to cultivate what the Bible calls the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you, it says, which was also in Christ Jesus. The excellence of the believer as far as your faith walk is not just dependent on the health of your spirit, but your extent of transformation. Many, many believers are saved but they are not transformed. And this is why God cannot do much with them. Again, I repeat, many believers are saved, but they have refused to contend for transformation. Either because they do not understand the life-giving, transforming ministry of the Holy Spirit, either because they have rejected the Word of God and its power to purify, to change, to transform, or they have rejected the ministry of a teaching priest. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 15 says, And I will give you pastors or shepherds according to my heart. It says they shall feed you with wisdom, wisdom and with knowledge. Is someone learning? So let's, let's follow our progression again. So an unbeliever becomes a believer, even though a carnal one, immature, unfruitful in spiritual things. And by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, in partnership with the word of God and a teaching priest, that journey to transformation begins. Now, something happens when you make progress here. Something happens. When you become commendably transformed, you move to the next phase. It's called empowerment. Empowerment is useless 
to a believer who is not transformed. Listen carefully. Empowerment is useless to a believer who is not transformed. Unfortunately, and with all due respect, the Pentecostal charismatic circle, we talk a lot about the anointing. We like the anointing. We like power. The reason why we fall and stand and fall and stand and roll and shout and there's no evidence of growth is because our attention is on power, not transformation. Jesus was not in a hurry to lay hands, nor impart, nor release the Spirit upon people. Look at the ratio of transformation to empowerment. Three and a half years to one day of Pentecost. Three and a half years to one day of Pentecost. If you're a man of God here, let me advise you. Do not be in a hurry to impart the anointing. The vessel matters. When the vessel is small, it makes the oil look small. The oil will always assume the shape of the vessel. So she comes to the prophet and the prophet said, what do you have in your house? He said, nothing except a little cruise. And the prophet said, the problem is not the oil. The vessel, go and borrow vessels. Expand your capacity in the spirit. It says, borrow not a few. As soon as there were more vessels, the oil started multiplying. Say Transformation. The name given to the process that makes you become like Jesus in experience. I am amazed at the fact that when Jesus became a man, not even him was imparted as a child. Jesus, he had to wade through the journey of 30 years. But the first thing he did from age 12 was to go to the temple and he was learning, even though he was the word incarnate. The value of his impartation, receiving the spirit, came upon the fact that he had now been transformed. And the test of his transformation would follow his encounter with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he was driven to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And Satan comes to him and Jesus replies by saying, It is written. That is the signature of a transformed believer. You have come to honor what is written greater than what you have seen or you are seen, greater than what you are hearing or you've heard. Someone say it is written. Yeah. So an unbeliever becomes a carnal, immature believer and then through growth, you become transformed. Then transformation makes way for empowerment. Now hear this. At the point you are empowered, your name changes from a believer to a witness. You see that you don't just become a witness because you are a Christian. There are many Christians who are not witnesses. A witness is a validator. It's a legal expression and I, I, I don't want to bore you with all of that. A witness is only needed in court if there is contention. The assignment of the witness is to bring validation to a statement. Am I right on that? So when God calls us witnesses, we are not just mere believers. It means we have been empowered, number one, by the mind of Christ, the truth of scripture, and then number two, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now he can send us. It is only a witness that can be used to bring revival, not the believer. The believer is in Christ, but cannot be used as an agent of revival. You see why we have so many believers in church, so many believers in America with all due respect, and yet the move of God seems to be in trickles. It is because we have not transited through growth, transformation, and empowerment to become witnesses. Someone is evolving in this conference to a witness. Say amen. I say to you again that someone is evolving in this conference to be a witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Abraham had begun his walk with God, but his name did not change. He was still Abraham, even though he was with God. But a time came when a transition happened and he was changed to Abraham, the father of nations. A transition always happens and with that, your name would change. Same thing happened to Jacob. From Jacob, he now became Israel. For as a prince, you have had power with God. I'm praying for someone here. In the name of Jesus, 
the level of transformation that will allow for profitable empowerment. May you begin that journey with the Holy Spirit. For someone, God is answering you right now. Why you see yourself having dreams, prophetic encounters, and you see yourself on crusade grounds doing mighty things for the kingdom, but physically you never seem to step into that prophecy. God, the version of you the anointing is looking for is not this version. There is a version of you the oil is looking for. And every time the grace of God comes to you, it finds an unrenewed version. And the oil will have to wait patiently until you grow. Someone tell yourself, myself grow. Myself grow. Prophesy, myself grow. Grow. Become transformed. So that you will become that vessel. Are we still learning? Remember I told you that the move of God, the program of God, territorial transformation, revival, happens when God finds available aligned and trained vessels and so i'm walking you through the pathway that is starts by default for all men as unbelievers unsaved then you transit to a believer albeit an immature one void of spiritual intelligence and through the ministry of the holy spirit in partnership with the written word and a teaching priest they are enhancers to your transformation then you get to a point of maturity in the spirit. You are furnished understanding the ways of God. Now that gives way to spiritual empowerment. And that happens by the spirit of God. At the point of empowerment, you assume a new status in the spirit. You are not called a believer, even though you are still a believer. But the new status is a witness. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. It says you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses, validators, validators, validators of my claim. And then notice he never defines jurisdiction for believers but the moment he mentions the ministry of witness he now says Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the most part of the earth. Let me show you how witnesses function. Acts chapter 8 and verse 5. The Bible tells us that a very potent witness called Philip, he went down to Samaria. Witness is always location dependent. And the Bible says there he preached Christ unto them. Then it says the people gave heed with one accord, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. There were extraordinary manifestations of God's power. Are we together? And then the next verse says there was joy. There was joy in the city. It always affects the territory when you are a witness. A true witness does not stop um, with your personal progress. If all you have to show us as far as your Christian work is concerned is that I'm doing well, the word of God is working for me, my children are doing well, I'm happy, I'm prospering, I'm loving God, you are still a believer, you are not yet a witness. You cannot be used to fan the flames of revival because the moment you transit to become a witness, it no longer becomes about you. You see, the burden of being a witness is that self dies as God's program grows through your life. So it's no longer about you. You have learned the rudiments that keep you healthy, strong, healed. Now you focus on God's program. The language of a witness is that I took this city for Jesus. I took this territory for Jesus. And there are two elements that are used to describe a witness. One is light, the other is salt. Not to bore you, but there's something interesting about light. Light does not have to be everywhere to shine. You can place light from one point and it can shine all across. So the Bible says, let your light. The word let means permit, allow. Do not hinder. Let your light so shine before men. Help those under the anointing. Let your light so shine before men. 
Are we together? Then he says, you are salt. The thing I like about salt is that the moment it gets into the pot, it changes. You don't see it again. To know there's salt there, you have to taste the food. The moment you drop salt, it dissolves, but it is not weak. And the thing about salt is that it is never too late to add salt. Never too late to add salt. Hmm. Are we learning? So when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, you step into a system and sometimes you look very frail, but you begin to influence the system. Your first spoon taking your meal and you know there's salt here. He says we are light and we are salt. So one last time, let me walk you through that journey. An unbeliever to an immature believer to a transformed believer to an empowered believer to a witness. Can we run it one more time? An unbeliever. Next is an immature believer, a babe, an infant in the spirit, even though saved. Then through the journey of transformation, that person becomes a transformed believer. Am I right on that? Next is empowerment, an empowered believer. Then an empowered believer becomes a witness. There's no point knowing your assignment or knowing your kingdom assignment when you are any other thing but a witness.